Okay, we're going to be in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7 today. Let's go ahead and read our text first, and then we'll go back and try to unfold it. And I'm calling the message, Committed to Your Calling. Committed to Your Calling. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying they laid their hands on them. The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Lord, we ask for your blessing as we open up your word, we read it, as we think on it, Lord, and meditate on your word today, we pray for enlightenment and understanding, that Lord, you would help us in our own lives to be committed to our calling. In Jesus' name, amen. Satan has at least three main tactics that he likes to use to try to hinder the work of God in the church. Tactic number one is persecution. He will use people from outside the church to persecute the church in order to try to stop its effectiveness or its advance in the world. And we see that happening in Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5. The apostles are arrested, they're threatened, and then in chapter 5, they're actually flogged and released. So they're persecuted from the outside. Tactic number two is corruption. If he can't get someone from the outside to persecute the church and to stop its advancement, then he'll do something from inside. And so we see in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, Satan filled their hearts to lie to the Holy Spirit. So there was this deception and this hypocrisy going on within the church. But God stepped in with swift and severe chastisement and killed them in order to stop the spread of this hypocrisy within the early church. Tactic number three, if Satan can't stop the church through persecution or corruption, then he may try the third one, which is distraction. He'll try to get the church distracted from doing what he has called it to do. And so stalemate their efforts. And we find that happening here in Acts chapter 6 verses 1 to 7. The possibility of the apostles becoming distracted from what God had called them to do to getting focused on doing something entirely different. So in Acts chapter 6 there was this real possibility of the unity of the early church being threatened. Notice in verse 1 it says, now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose. A complaint. Uh, the people were starting to murmur and to grumble and to complain about some issue that was arising. Now, the reason this is so interesting is because it's the very first place in the book of Acts where you find anything like this. Up until this time, over and over, we're told that the people are of one accord, that they're of one heart and soul. Let's just read a few of those to, to show you what I'm saying. In Acts 1.14, it says, These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. In Acts 2.46, Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. In chapter 4, verse 24, And when they heard this, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth. And then chapter 4, verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. 
and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And then chapter 5, verse 12, At the hands of the apostles many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. So the Holy Spirit is emphasizing to us over and over and over the unity that this early church possessed together. When we come to chapter 6, there's the first threatening of this beautiful spiritual unity that they had enjoyed because there was a complaint, this murmur, this grumbling that was starting. So I believe in chapter 6 we find Satan, he's exhausted persecution, that didn't work. He's exhausted corruption, God dealt with that one, that didn't work. So he's going to try distraction. He's going to try to get people arguing and complaining and murmuring so that there's this unsettled spirit amongst the church. Now I think that they were probably murmuring against the 12 apostles. It doesn't say so, but I think that's what's happening because it was the 12 apostles who had received the relief money. Do you remember when someone had sold a house or a land? They would take the proceeds and they would lay it at the apostles' feet and then it was the apostles' job to distribute it to anyone who had need. Well here, there were there was a group of people within the church who felt like they had a need and it wasn't being taken care of. The apostles have received money from people who'd sold houses or land, but yet the Hellenistic Jews there, the widows, still had need and were being overlooked and so they felt slighted. And like the apostles perhaps weren't doing their job and they weren't treating them fairly along with the native Hebrew widows. Now let's see if we can understand this this problem that was arising. There's two groups of Jews. It's not that we have Jews and Gentiles here. We don't. These are all Jewish people, but there's two kinds of Jews. Here in verse 1, it talks about the Hellenistic Jews, and it talks about the native Hebrews. They're both Jewish, but there is a, there's a difference. In fact, there's a rift was starting to develop between these two groups of Jews. Now, the Hellenistic Jews... Those would be Jews who lived outside of Palestine. They would be Jews who spoke Greek instead of Aramaic. They would probably be reading the Septuagint version of the Old Testament because the Septuagint version was written in Greek. Uh, they would be those who were steeped in Greek culture. So a Hellenistic Jew is a Jew, but a Jew who's steeped in, in Greek culture and Greek writing and Greek thought. He speaks Greek. He's basically a Greek who happens to be a Jew. A native Hebrew would be a Jew who is not steeped in Greek culture, who has remained true to this, his Hebrew roots. He reads the Hebrew scriptures. He speaks Aramaic. And so there's this difference between these two kinds of Jews within the early church there in Jerusalem. And don't you think that probably the native Hebrews might look their noses down a little bit on these Greek-speaking Jews like they're compromisers? Uh, you know, we're, we're the purists. We've made, remained true to our Hebrew roots and these other people, they've gone into Greek culture and they don't even speak Aramaic anymore. They speak Greek. And so perhaps there was a looking down on different people within the body of Christ here in Jerusalem. So there's the threat of division, threat of discord, whereas up until now they'd experienced beautiful harmony and, and unity together. Now notice that is happening when the disciples were increasing. Verse 1. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, that's interesting. If you go back to chapter 5, verse 14, it says, And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. So their church growth is going crazy. <laughs> the church in Jerusalem is just, it doesn't say it's, they're being added like it did back in chapter 2. They're multiplying. There's a multiplication of believers taking place. In chapter 5, verse 42, we read that every day in the temple and from house to house they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They had been flogged, they'd been persecuted, they'd been jailed, they'd been threatened, but when they got out of jail they just went right back to teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So the apostles are bearing bold witness 
to Jesus Christ there in Jerusalem. Multitudes of people are coming to Christ. It's a great work of the Holy Spirit calling men to Christ. However, when we get to chapter 6, there is the temptation for the apostles to leave the word of God. They've been teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. There's a temptation to leave doing that and to focus on this new problem that has arisen in their midst and to make sure these Hellenistic Jewish widows are being taken care of. But the apostles believe that leaving the word would be a grave mistake. We know that because in verse 2, they say, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. So they know it's a mistake. And then in verse 7, we read of the effect of them not leaving the word. What happened when they did not leave the word? It said the word of God kept on spreading. And the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Now, look at verse 1 and then verse 7. Verse 1 says, while the disciples were increasing, this complaint arose. Verses 2 through 6 tell us that the apostles decided not to get involved in trying to personally take care of this problem that had arisen. They're going to select seven other men to do that, that work. They're going to stay focused on prayer and the Word of God. And the result of all of that is the Word of God kept on spreading. And the number of the disciples continued to increase, and even the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. So there was a potentially serious problem. There was a need to be met. There was work to be done. The question was, who was supposed to do that work? And I think here we find a need for all of us to serve God according to to God's call on our life. I think that's, that's the lesson I am seeing from this passage. That's what the apostles did, and God blessed it with more disciples coming to Christ, more priests becoming obedient to the faith. The word of God kept on spreading. So God's blessing followed what they did here. So as we work our way through the passage, the first thing I want you to focus in on is Notice the temptation for the apostles to neglect God's call in their life. They had considered getting involved themselves in trying to meet this need. And I say that because in verse 1, or verse 2, they say, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. That tells me that they had thought about it. They had thought whether they should get involved in it. And they had come to the decision, no, I don't think we should. It's not desirable. Well, the word desirable means pleasing. I think what they're saying, it's not pleasing to the Lord for us to get involved and take all of our time and energy and focus on this issue. Because if we do that, the word of God is going to suffer. So we have to come up with another solution to this problem. Now, why do you think they would have been tempted to get involved in solving the problem themselves. They thought about it, and there was probably a temptation to do it. Um, I think they were probably tempted to rush in and begin serving tables. Now, I can only speculate, because I don't know exactly what was going through their minds, but it, I've got some ideas that came to me, some possible suggestions as to why they would be tempted to do that. Number one, they might have felt guilty if they didn't because they were in charge of distributing the monies to those who were in need there in Jerusalem. That was their job as the apostles. The people brought the money to their feet and then they made sure it was distributed to people who had need. Well, here were Hellenistic Jewish widows that had a great need and they were charged with the responsibility of making sure that need was taken care of. Who else should get involved? You know, they might have thought, if I don't do this, I'm guilty because that's my job. I'm supposed to make sure the church is taken care of. Uh, secondly, perhaps they were tempted to get involved just because they had a genuine love of people. I'm sure they did. God's people in Jerusalem were hurting. There was this whole segment of the church where they were feeling overlooked and neglected. And they had real needs that were not go being met. Other people's needs were being met but not theirs. And so they probably felt 
What's wrong? I'm, why are we being slighted? What's wrong with us? Aren't we as good as anybody else in this church? I mean, what, what's happening here? And so just to, in order to stop the pain and the misunderstanding and the possible division, it would be very tempting for them to rush in and just hands on, get it settled and over with and move on. Or, number three, perhaps they just simply saw a genuine need that wasn't being met. Nobody else was meeting the need. Nobody was doing anything about it, and so they felt, well, we have to do it, because nobody else is. And the temptation can be the same in our lives, too. There can be the temptation for you to jump in and use all of your time and effort and energy to getting, getting involved in a particular area of ministry that God hasn't called you to. And the result's not going to be great. Uh, it, you are going to be frustrated and exhausted. And because God hasn't called you and gifted you in that particular area, you won't be very effective either. So we need to be thinking about what has God called us to and how do we give ourselves to what God has called us to rather than all these other areas of potential need. Now this isn't easy to do because, because we genuinely love people. Um, we see needs that aren't being met and we think, well, I have to do it. Nobody else is. This, these people are hurting. I need to stop their hurt. And, but we just need to take a step back and, and ask the Lord, is this Lord what you're calling me to do? To be spirit directed rather than just humanly directed, right? Okay, so let's look at, at the need to know God's call on our lives. The, the apostles knew God's call because they tell us in verse 2, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. What does that tell you? They knew that God had called them to serve up the word of God. And they shouldn't leave it, because that that's what God's call was on their life. Or verse 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. There it is. God had called them to prayer and the ministry of the word. So it's, it's not desirable that we leave it. Instead, we're going to devote ourselves to it. In fact, the word devote there is the same word that we have in Acts 2.42, where it says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship and prayer. Same word. So the apostles knew God's call. That word devote means intense and persevering application or unwearied effort. They knew that their God-given call was to be consumed in the ministry of the word and prayer. And that if they got involved in other things, it would dilute their effectiveness for Christ because that wasn't where God had called them. They knew they couldn't do it all. If they were going to be effective in ministry, they couldn't be dividing up their time and their energy in a hundred different directions trying to solve every problem in the church. Remember how big the church is now. Thousands and thousands of people. It's not 15 people like we've got. <laughs> there could be 25 to 50,000 people within the church in Jerusalem, meeting in homes throughout the week and sometimes in the temple when, to hear the apostles. So you've got all these people and all these problems. And if they tried to solve all the problems themselves, who's going to be the ones out there boldly preaching the gospel to the lost? That's how the lost were getting saved. If no one's doing that, then the ministry is going to suffer. And I think our mistake is that we think we can do it all. And that God wants us to do everything. Well, God doesn't want you to do everything, and he doesn't want you to do all things. He wants you to do what he's called you to do. We can sometimes, I think, I don't know if it's happening here in our church. I, I don't see any signs of this, but I, I have been in some churches where busyness is seen as a sign of spirituality. Or if you are committing yourself to every night of the week, um, then you're the super spiritual person in the church. But you know, we, my, my mom used to go down to the auction. This is when we lived actually in Carmichael. It's crazy that we did it in a residential area of Carmichael, but she'd go to the auction and buy chickens, and she would come home with a hatchet and chop their heads off. <laughs> 
And that chicken would flop on the ground and he would, his legs would be jerking and he'd be jerking. Sometimes they'd even run with, without a head. They'd run around for a while and then they'd flop down. And, and it reminds me of that because, you know, look at that chicken. How busy, busy, busy that chicken is running around. <laughs> but the only reason is he's got so much frenzied activity is because his head has been cut off from the body. And when we are cut off from the head... Jesus Christ, we could have lots of frenzied activity, busy, 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 but maybe we're not going in the direction the Lord wants us to go. Amen. So just lots of activity doesn't make you super spiritual. Directed activity, when the Lord gives you a gift, it is right, when you know your gift, to, to, to labor with all your might, using that gift for the benefit of the body. But just to throw yourself in a hundred different directions, just because you see all these needs, is not necessarily the will of God. Even Jesus Christ didn't try to do everything. Do you remember in John chapter 4, it says that even Jesus was not the one doing the baptizing. His disciples were. That's John 4 verse 2. In John chapter 5 and verse 19, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it's something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. So what things was Jesus doing? Everything that he possibly could have done? No, it was the things he saw the Father doing. He did specific things that the Father was showing him to do. He was following the direction of his Father. When you get to John chapter 17, at the very end of Jesus' life, and here he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we have his high priestly prayer, he says to the Father in John 17, 4, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplish, accomplished the work which you have given me to do. The Father had a specific work that he called his Son to do. Jesus said, I did it. I did the things I saw you doing. I did the work you gave me to do. Now, Jesus didn't do every possible thing that could have been done, but he did the works that the Father gave him to do. And he's our example. So what is your calling, brothers and sisters, this morning? You say, well, I'm not a pastor. I don't have a calling. That's your first mistake. <laughs> People talk about, you know, I'm, on, I'm not in full-time Christian ministry. You're not? Are you a Christian? Are you a part-time Christian or a full-time Christian? <laughs> if you're a full-time Christian, are you called to serve? Yes. Do you know the word ministry means service? Mm -hmm. If you're a Christian all the time and God has called you to serve, you're in full-time Christian ministry. Now, you may not um, be paid by other people so that you don't have a secular job. I think that's what people mean, right? Full-time Christian ministry is they're a pastor and they don't work a secular job. But let's put the jobs aside. All of us are in full-time Christian ministry because we're Christians full-time and we're called to ministry. Yes. So let's not have this dichotomy of the clergy and the laity. We are all the people of God, all called to some kind of ministry. Um, remember when Paul would start his letters? He would say, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. They Take out the word Paul from there and take out the word apostle. Put your first name in. Paula, a blank by the will of God. Just because you're not in full-time Christian ministry without a, working a secular job doesn't mean that you don't have a role that God has called you to play in His world. So who are you by the will of God? That's what I want you to think about right now. What has God called you to? What does He want you to be doing with your life? Okay, just think about that for a second. Um, we do know that our calling has to do with service. We know that because when we get back to Acts chapter 6, it wasn't just that the seven were the ones doing the serving. They did serve tables, but the apostles also were serving. Because it says in verse 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry or the service of the word. So the seven were serving physical food, the apostles were serving spiritual food, but they were all serving. And we started off this morning in 1 Peter 4.10, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another. And then he talks about those who speak and those who act. But all of us, see, 
every Christian is to serve, and the way they serve is by using the gift that God has given them to serve. Okay? So you need to ask yourself, what gifts has God given me? Let me ask you a question. What are you motivated to do? What do you find fulfillment in doing? What are you excited about? What has God put in your heart to do for His kingdom and His glory and to edify others? That should be the first question you should just ask. Okay. Because in Romans chapter 12, we have a list, I think it's seven different gifts there. We call those the motivational gifts of the Spirit. It's because those gifts, you're motivated to do them. Whether it's service, or prophecy, or exhortation, or uh, mercy. There's all these different gifts listed. But they're, they're, they're the gifts that you find yourself motivated to be involved in doing those kinds of activities. So what am I motivated to do? Number one. Number two... What do you see God's blessing on when you do it? Like, when I do this, I see the Lord working through me. I see his hand upon me. That's a, a clear clue to you that this is something that he wants you to be doing. Something that you're motivated to do and something that God blesses when you do it. So I let that be running through the back of your mind, okay, as we work our way through our text today. Now, number three. Let's talk about the way to fulfill God's call in your life. How do you do it? Well, how did the apostles do it? They had to delegate. Instead of taking on everything that came down the pike, they said, no, we're not going to take on everything because if we do that, we'll be ineffective in what God has called us to do. We're going to have you folks select seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, and then we'll lay our hands on them and appoint them to this task. So delegation. The apostles were not the ones that served tables. Now, what, was it because they were above serving tables? Were they better than everybody else? It wasn't a matter of that, was it? Jesus himself, the Lord of the universe, was not above stooping down on his knees and washing the feet of his disciples. Jesus wasn't above that. Neither are we. We're not above anything. Amen. And no Christian should be above anything. We should, you know, any one of us at any time should be willing to clean up somebody's vomit or clean, out, clean up a bath, a toilet. I mean, I've seen Christians do that with joy. So, so we're, yeah, we're not above it. It's simply that it's not a wise use of our time because God hasn't gifted us in those areas. And so we're not going to be very effective at it. So if we want to be effective in seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then we need to be careful as to how we invest ourselves. Isn't it true, though, that God has, has wired us? He's wired us differently from one another. Yes. And don't you think there must be a reason for that? He's got a purpose for making us the way he's made us. We don't have to be exactly like the next person. In fact, if you, if you are, why would God make two of the same person? <laughs> he, he's got a reason to make you a little bit different than everybody else. <laughs> now, what would be the cost if the apostles tried to serve the widows by themselves, if they got involved? What would the cost be? Well, it would be a huge cost. The word being taught yeah. 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 would be sacrifice. That's right. So there would be the potential for false teaching to come in because the truth is not being preached. And the gospel wouldn't be going out because they don't have time for it anymore. There's no time to preach the gospel. So the word of God would be hindered. So grave harm could come to the work of God simply by doing a good thing, the wrong people doing the, the right thing. You see what I mean? They need to find the right people to do the, the right thing instead of the wrong people to do the right thing. So what do they do? Let's, let's take a look. Verse 3. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. So they presented to the church the problem and what they believed the solution was. So they're providing leadership to the church. But then they asked the church to get involved. And they said, we want you to find men that fit these three criteria, and you let us know who they are. They've got to be people of good reputation, 
And so that would mean these are godly people. They don't have a wicked reputation or a sinful reputation. They're, they have a godly reputation in the church. Secondly, they're full of the Spirit, meaning they're full of the graces of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. You see the Holy Spirit working through their life. It's obvious. And thirdly, they're full of wisdom. They're known as people who are wise and could, can find wise solutions to problems. So the apostles took the lead in solving the problem, but they didn't do everything. They got the church involved as well. And I, I see a, a beautiful lesson there. Because I've been in, well, Debbie and I have been in churches where the pastor made all the decisions and simply informed everybody of what he was doing. We were not involved at all. The church wasn't involved. The pastor did everything. <laughs> but there's also the other extreme, certain churches where the congregation votes on everything. And there's no, and the leader of that church has no more influence than anybody else. I see a kind of a mix of the two happening here. The apostles are definitely providing leadership in this whole decision that's being made, but they're also involving the congregation as well. Both, both are coming together in order to provide the solution. And that's why whenever a, a new elder is appointed, we like to get the input of the congregation before that is done. We, we want to know what the congregation thinks about this individual. Do they see them as a mature, godly person? Or do they, do they know something about that person that might disqualify them? So that's just one example, but that's how we've tried to incorporate both. Leadership, of the present leadership is involved, but also the congregation is involved. The apostles affirmed the congregation's decision. Look at verse 6. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. So the apostles ratified and said, yes, we do believe you made the right selection here. These seven men fit those three qualifications. They prayed, and then they laid their hands on them. And it's also interesting, if you look at the names of the seven men in verse 5, they're all Greek names. So it was the Greek widows that were being overlooked. So they didn't find native Hebrews to solve it. They chose Hellenistic Greek men to, to uh, solve the problem of these Hellenistic Greek widows. In other words, they, they, I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> Am I making sense? You, you understand? They, they, they weren't playing favorites. They said, okay, this group here has the problem. Let's select men from that group to meet that problem so that they felt like they were on the same wavelength. Yeah. They're likely to understand. Yes, they're going to understand them, for sure. Because they're all, from, they're, they're all Greek cultured Jews. They understand one another. Amen. Now let's look finally at the result of committing to God's call. What's the result? Well, other men are now raised up and freed to serve in the body of Christ that were not doing so before. You've got seven men now who have been raised up and they're going about this work of making sure these Greek-speaking widows are being served. They're giving an opportunity to function in a God-ordained role and task. If the apostles had decided that they were going to do everything, these seven men would never have had a chance to learn to minister. And we know that two of them, Philip and Stephen, went on in chapter 7 and chapter 8 to do far more than just um, providing physical food to widows. Stephen becomes a bold preacher who actually works signs and wonders and Philip becomes an evangelist who also works signs and wonders. So they start by serving widows, they start in that way, but that's not the end. God then begins, continues to raise them up in these higher areas of spiritual ministry where they're actually doing healings, casting out demons, and preaching the gospel. The apostles were also freed to be devoted to their calling. That's another blessing. Therefore, there's not going to be a burnout, or frustration, or exhaustion, because they're working in their own lane, the lane that God has built them for. Not somebody else's lane, but the lane God has built for them. And the beautiful thing is, verse 7 says, the word of God kept on spreading. The ministry of the word would have suffered, 
It was the ministry of the word God was using to convert the lost and also to sanctify the saved. That would have been hindered if they, if they left that particular role. So for the apostles to neglect the word, even to do, to do something as good as making sure widows were receiving their daily allotment of food, which is a great thing, would have had a bad result. So let's draw this down to a conclusion today. I'm going to give you a couple of ideas, and then I'd like to, to get us in a discussion, thinking and talking. First of all, we need to, each of us, identify what God has called us to. What spiritual gifts has God blessed you with? What motivates you? When do you most see God's hand on your life? What activity are you doing when you see, yeah, God blesses this when I do it? Where all three of those things line up, you're going to find your calling. Your spiritual gifts, uh, the thing that motivates you and provides satisfaction and excitement to you, and number three, where you see God's effectiveness in your life. Now when you find that thing, you might look at it as like three circles. And the, when the circles come together and you've, and you've got that little sliver in the middle that's connected to all three, that's your calling. When you find that thing, do that with all your might. Give yourself to that. In Romans chapter 12, in verse 6, Paul says, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If serving, in his serving. If, no, he who teaches, in his teaching. So here's the point. If God has given you the gift of service, then exercise that gift in serving. Pretty easy to understand, right? If God has... Uh, gifted you in teaching, then exercise that gift in teaching. In other words, give yourself to manifesting those gifts in your life. And that's where God is going to use you. Now, let me, just, let me just ask you guys, and you raise your hand if this is true, if you feel unsure or confused about the spiritual gifts that God has given to you. Just raise your hand if you're not sure about that. Okay, okay, I thought it might be helpful for the rest of the church to help each other because sometimes we can see something that the individual themselves can't see. 